episode of our sustainable garden. Um, so we've come out hoping to get some gardening done and the moment we step foot outside it starts to hail. I've literally just put my washing on the line as well so I'm a bit annoyed. Put the bunny in her run but um, I'm hoping it's just going to blow over. It's been such weird weather the past few days. Yesterday when we finished gardening it snowed and it's April, nearly mid-April. Climate change, it's worrying. But anyway, I'm going to be cracking on with the garden today, so join us. So this is our strawberry kind of run that I showed you guys in the last video. But I need to just get rid of all the dead leaves that are in and amongst it. And also I need to de-weed all along here next to our pond. So I'm going to make a start on that. Can you see Bobbins in there? She's loving the grass. Why do you love gardening so much? Uh, I guess it just gets me outside, connects with nature a bit. But growing up, I always used to watch stuff like country tracks with Ray Mears, which was very outdoorsy, and uh, some of the early river cottages as well. So it's always sort of a dream just to rear in some of my own food and grow my own food. Obviously, I, I used to fish a lot and uh, I used to eat meat, but now I'm 100% plant based. So naturally when I, I turned plant-based I naturally went to growing my own stuff and I just think it's therapeutic like when you're doing it you don't really think of other things so if I'm sat watching tv I'm probably thinking about work or whatever but when I'm in the garden I'm just focused on doing the job so it's very rewarding and then there's lots of good distractions as well so even though you're working you know like yesterday we were watching the blackbird forage and take food back yeah. to the nest then we found the slow worms. Uh, last year we saw the dragonflies in the pond. So it's sort of, even though it's a small space, it's like ever changing. I've got this on my head now. It's <laughs> sort of uh, ever changing and, and just like, I really like it. And uh, one year, yeah, I don't know if I just said, but I grew my own Christmas dinner, which was plant-based. Yeah. So we had to freeze some of the stuff because obviously it was ready in summer, but I had my own sprouts, potatoes, carrots, parsnips. I think you had some turnips and stuff on there as well. And another thing is as well, it's rewarding because it's your little space and once, you know, once you first cook your own food, you know, it's not a scientific thing, but it, it seems to just taste fresher and you appreciate it more. Because when, when you uh, pick up a kilo of carrots, for example, in a supermarket and it's 50p, you just value it at 50p, but, but then when you try and grow a kilo of carrots, you realise the amount of work what goes in. So you sort of appreciate the food more, I think. Yeah, I think um, the supermarkets do fruit and veg so cheap now that it, it, it cheapens just the appreciation, doesn't it? Yeah. And like so much food gets thrown away, it's actually like disgusting. And like a lot of this food is perfectly good. It's just we have to put, um, supermarkets put a sell by date on to protect them really, stop them getting sued. But it's usually way before the, the food's actually ready to go out of date. Yeah, and a lot of food just gets ploughed in the fields as well. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty thing as well, because we, we've got to appreciate and recognise the fact that, you know, farming does have a massive impact on the environment, but it also can have a massive positive impact as well. So many of the impacts are negative and often uh, farmers get a lot of blame for that. But I always think, well, is it the farmer or is it the consumer? So I think because we value food and it, uh, so much less and expect foods to be so cheap. And if instantaneous. Yeah, if you're a dairy farmer milking your cows two to three times a day, working 365, getting up at half three in the morning and then you're getting pennies for a litre of milk, you know, the margins must be so fine that, you know, when it comes to environmental consequences and animal welfare and stuff like that, and I think because we pay so little for our food, that, that's just going to be a negative impact. Mm. Where I think of if we get higher quality food and uh, paid more for our food, but appreciated it more, then I think 
you know, we could perhaps farm less because we would waste less because there's a value to it. And then we could uh, essentially rewild areas of farmland which perhaps is not as productive as we would like it to be. But because we're producing better food at a higher cost, it's not that drive to produce so much. So I do think it comes from the consumer. Mm. But on the other hand, you know, people live in poverty even in the UK, so food does need to be reasonable. But I always liken it to when, and I know I'm ranting now, but it's something I'm passionate about, like, People won't buy an organic chicken for £10, but they'll buy a takeaway pizza for £18, which is, you know, got ingredients from all over the world. Uh, it's nutritionally bad for you, and so on, when you could probably have some local produce, some local fruit and veg. Make your own pizza out of local yeah. produce. And it's no coincidence, and you know, we're guilty of it too, and sometimes we get takeaways and stuff, but you know, we do try our best to buy as much organic or this year grow as much food as possible. But I think as well it's just genius marketing that you, you'll pay two quid for a chocolate bar, but you won't pay two quid for apples. Yeah. So, you know, junk food's always cheaper than fruit and veg, but then you've got the consequences of the impact on the NHS which perhaps this year and last year more than ever we, we seem to appreciate. So I think, you know, if we perhaps supported local more and paid a bit more, then local producers, and many of them do, I'm not saying they don't, but, you know, producers wouldn't have so much pressure to maximise the potential of their land, so there would be more space for nature and there would be less environmental destruction and less chemical use, which is a massive one. And when we're munching on our food, we probably don't think about it. Anyway, um, ran over I, and do. I, I said gardening, I don't get distracted, and here I am just waffling. So. <laughs> that's, Stu, that's Stu's two cents on sustainable food. So, what we're doing now, guys, is just clearing the strawberry bed a bit, just ready for this year, so we get rid of some of the dead leaves. The dead leaves are quite good, to, essentially, they, we've got a build up of them because they are like a self mulching compost in a way. But just in preparation for the fruit growing. We want the ground to be really clean so it keeps the fruit quite fresh and unbruised. So what we'll probably do once the fruit starts coming through is just put some straw between the strawberries as well. So the fruits just rest on the straw and it's just nice and clean and we get really clean uh, market ready or breakfast ready strawberries. So uh, just quickly while we're on strawberries as well, I just want to say uh, another quick thing about strawberries. So we've got a bank of strawberries here and we've got another bank of strawberries down there. And this year we've actually bought some more strawberries because we're going to plant some at the bottom of the garden. But what we've done is buy a different variety. So we want to buy several varieties and then essentially we won't get fruit from the ones down there this year. But eventually we'll have strawberries if we're lucky between May and September because we'll have different varieties which fruit at different time of the year. But when you pick up a pack of strawberries, you, you might be looking, you know, and of course you can do it for tea, but you might be looking at like between five and ten pound for a pack of strawberries, which does seem quite a lot of investment because you might think, well, I can get a pack of strawberries for a pound, but uh, you know, the fresher they are, the, the more juicy they are, and the tastier they are, and the British ones are the best anyway because there's less travel and so on. And when you get them out of your garden, they're, they're generally fresher. So it is worth an investment, but just remember that five to ten pound in that tray is not just what you're getting so strawberries will actually root out and grow another plant so i just wanted to emphasize all this bed and all the bed there is just from one little pack of strawberries i bought four or five years ago so each year some of the older plants i might remove but the younger plants will grow through so don't just see it as well wow, that's ten pound for a decent pack of organic strawberries see it as eventually in a few years you can have like literally rows of them and the ones we bought are the first time we bought strawberries in a long time but again it's because I want more varieties so we can sort of extend the fruit in season and um, we eat a lot of strawberries but one of the downsides to strawberries whether they're imported or local strawberries is just the sheer amount of plastic they come in as well so it's a bit of a pain that the packs come in plastic but that's sort of a one-off thing where if we buy them every week in the supermarket we often get through quite a lot of plastic so does seem expensive on the face of it but actually when you look at it as a lifetime investment in your strawberries a couple of quid a year it is nothing really it's essentially investing in a cheap pack of strawberries a year but you can grow your own and uh, get some reward out of them and, and make them probably the tastiest strawberries you've ever eaten 
So we finished de debris all the strawberries and we've weeded the path all along here and cleared all this. There's a few rogue strawberries. I'm going to fill all this bit back up with bark, make it all nice and neat and tidy. And then I'm sure after that, Stu will give me another job, won't you? Yes, but look, we've left all the dandelions. Yeah, there's still dandelions in our garden. Actually, I'm going to show you that properly. So um, it's a bit difficult to see because we've got the bunny outdoor cage up here, but you can see that we haven't mown this for a le very long time and there's dandelions everywhere. So um, like I said in the last episode, we keep the dandelions for the bees until um, spring has really sprung and there's a lot more flowers around and then we give this area a bit of a mow because this is kind of like our relax area. And then we've got ferny bobbins in there enjoying some fresh dandelions. Oh, she's so beautiful. So there we go. All oh, my shadow's in the way. Let's get down here. So there we have it. My lovely de-weeded and barked border so that we can walk along it. Oh, sorry, I just kicked the camera upwards. Tidied up around the pond, filled the bark up. So we put these bark paths in just so that we don't have to stand on the plants. And also it suppresses weeds from growing and uh, the bark is on top of black weed suppressor fabric. So yeah, hopefully if we keep on top of it, this should stay nice and neat. Now I've got to do this bit. <laughs> so this is another veg bed and I'm just going to completely de-weed it. And then I guess we're going to put some compost on it like the others. Yeah. Yeah. What are we going to plant in this one? Don't know yet. We're... We haven't decided. Really, you should plan, but we'll just uh, have a look to see what we want and, and what we'll use the most. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, let's get weeding. I was saying to Stu just now how um, I think I found my hobby in life, apart from all the cetacean research I do and stuff but I've um I'm a very type a person so I'm just like go 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 all the time and I'm, I'm on this mission to learn how to relax but I really struggle to sit still um so but I love being outside so this is perfect because I'm outside I'm grounding myself by touching the earth um I'm just spending time in the fresh outdoors which is good for your mental health, good for your physical health. I'm moving around so I don't feel fidgety. And like, you can't help but focus just on the gardening really. And it's nice just me and Stu having a chat and having a, a giggle, planning our future whilst preparing our garden. So if you're like me and you struggle with relaxing, and you're lucky enough to have a garden or a few pots on your balcony or whatever just go out and like rather than turning on the telly or opting for your mobile phone scrolling session get out in the garden put your hands in the earth grow something make yourself proud get fit i mean we did 23,000 steps on saturday just in this garden so i wish i could clock that for hiking to hedgehogs Thank you. 
So, for now, finished with this bit. It's looking much tidier. I'm well impressed with myself. Um, we're not going to compost this today because we haven't decided what we're going to put on there. So we're just going to leave that. And now we're tackling this section. So we're going to clear it, try and cut those brambles back and make it a bit more hospitable. But never fear, we don't get rid of all the brambles because look at this mecca for butterflies. It goes back really far. It's thick. And uh, in the summer, we get loads of butterflies in there. So don't worry, we don't get rid of all of it. We're just trying to um, get rid of the annoying stuff so that we can use this section of the garden more. Okay, so I mentioned yesterday about us having compost heaps, which we don't use because of the slow worms on it. But again, one of the most sustainable things we can do is make our own compost. This year, we've had to buy some in, but we have got some rough compost we started making last year. And in preparation for next year, we'll keep making some more. But what we need to do first of all is this is full of twigs and seeds. So essentially, I've got a bucket and I made a sieve out of some old uh, rabbit hutch. You can get finer sieves as well, so you can do it multiple times. But uh, I'm just going to do a quick demonstration. So I'm going to get this compost, and you can see there's lots of twigs and stuff in this because we put brambles in, which we won't do next year. We'll just be using our peelings and garden waste and so on. And then drop it through, remove any plastic and then you can see I've got all these twigs here which obviously I don't want and there's stones and old snail shells and so on. So I'll just put a bit more in it and if I give it a quick rub over, rub over, you can just see in here now we have quite a nice compost. Yeah, we've still got some twigs in there but again you can do a finer sieve and next year, again, we're not going to put brambles in it. We weren't planning on really doing this this year, but we're determined to grow as much food as possible. So this will save us a fortune, but it will also recycle nutrients out of the garden as well. Daily slow worm inspection. Our girls having a bath. Okay, so what we're going to do now, we've done a, a lot of the hard work and, and digging soil over and getting all the weeds gone. So we're going to plant our courgettes. So we've got a nice little bed, which uh, we'll show you in a minute. And uh, courgettes like quite moist water. We don't want it waterlogged, so we just give it a quick uh, water first because they like the moist soil. They also like full sun, so even though there's big trees behind us, much of the sun comes across this way all day, so we will have lots of sun on there. And uh, these plants you want to keep about 60 centimetres or two rulers apart, um, which we're going to guesstimate it because we're a bit rolled gardeners, but we'll just picture two rulers and try and keep them apart by that much. Obviously it's much cheaper if you buy seeds and grow them for seeds, but at the moment we don't have a greenhouse and also we get into mid-April, so you know we've had other things on, so we're a bit late starting our garden this year. So hopefully next year we'll probably propagate some seeds rather than just get plants in. It saves money and uh, makes it a bit cheaper. But we're going to uh, crack on and, and get the plants in. So we're just going to put a few canes in with pots on the top 
just to uh, try and deter pigeons while we uh, plant our courgettes until they're established. Uh, we probably we have got a cage we can cover stuff with, but we'll save that for the brassicas just to keep the butterflies up. But again, we've got loads of wildflowers, dandelions, brambles, nettles, and so on, which the uh, butterflies are more than happy to have. And we put kale in as well with the wildflowers yesterday. So one thing as well about growing from seed is you get a lot less plastic so that's something we'll look to uh, reduce as we uh, crack on with our garden but we will recycle these for some of our seedlings so they're not going in the environment but I have been watching a few uh, things where you can make like paper seed uh, pots and you can just plant the seed pots in so they biodegrade so that's an option for the future but again we started late in the year so we're not making excuses but we're, we're playing catch up at the moment so stuff like this will recycle it won't go in the environment but we know in the future there's more and more alternatives we can use including homemade pots out of newspaper Okay guys, so that's it for this episode of our sustainable garden. We've got a lot done today and my back is aching, but we've got to go in now, wash up, because we've got an event tonight. Um, ironically, it's rewilding your garden, how to bring wildlife to your garden. So we've been actually actively working towards it ourselves, which is cool. So I really hope you enjoyed this and you found it inspiring to start growing your own veg. And we'll see you in the next video when we'll be doing some more gardening.